the most important um, quality in an artist is his ability to listen to his own artwork or his own ability to listen to any kind of artwork, which means to see, which means to be clairvoyant to the subtle energies and the subtle aspects that that exists uh, imminent or uh, overtly or covertly imminent or explicit in the artwork itself. To me, the artwork in itself, let's say, let's talk about painting. Uh, the thing that I'm really truly interested in when it comes to painting is not actually what the painting depicts. It's not the painting in itself. What interests me is the emotions or the psychology of the artist. Uh, how much is it that this artist understands about life and about psychology? I mean, I'm interested in the understanding of the artist. I'm interested in the psychology and the intellectual and spiritual standard, so to speak, of the artist. I'm, I'm interested in seeing the subtle signs in the painting, in the artwork, that conveys how this artist feels and thinks and understands things. Um, when it comes to major art, let's say paintings uh, like Rembrandt, Van Gogh, Giotto, Cimabue, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, or Raphael, Bernini, many, I mean, wonderful, uh, I mean, world-class art, I mean, divine art, or I mean, art that has tr transcended our standards of art, because it's simply just too good to say anything meaningful about it. <laughs> Those artworks have that which truly interests me the subtle things in the paintings, the subtle things, the thing, the, the, the hidden psychology of Rembrandt that I can see in the paintings, not the, not the psychology of that which he depicts, not the psychology of, of uh, the person that he is portraying, but the psychology of him, of Rembrandt, and that I can see in the brushstrokes, you know, in the brushstrokes, in the way of light and shade and darkness. I'm interested in how he feels, what is it that he is really, what is it that he wants, what is it that he feels, what is it that he understands, what is his deeper emotional motivation for making this work, which is very often not in the image, in the narrative of the painting itself, uh, not in the composition, not in the story of the painting, in itself, but in the brush strokes, in, in the way that it is executed. The way that a painting is made can tell you everything about the artist. And that's the thing that's interesting for me, for writers as well. I mean, when I, if I'm, if I open a book, uh, I will see in the first sentence how much this writer understands. If he has a high standard, of knowledge, understanding, and perception, and talent, then I'm willing to read more. But if I can see quickly that this writer doesn't have philosophical substance, he's not clairvoyant, so to speak, he doesn't have the ability to listen to the artwork in itself. He cannot, when he edited his own work, or when he may, when he delivered his work for a publication, there was something in him that did not, I mean, he didn't have the quality inside him, which is the true ability of listening clairvoyantly to the different aspects of the artwork itself, or the text, or the painting, or the photograph, or whatever it is. Dance too, uh, stage productions too. To listen to that which the art, artistic expression says, that, that's the most important thing 
I think, that you, you have to be able to listen because you're seeing with your ears. You're not seeing with your eyes. You're seeing with your whole psychology. You are perceptive with your whole psychology. You, you are seeing with your psyche, with your spirit. And you're feeling with your soul and with everything that you have inside you. You're not actually using your eyes. You are using a much finer, wider, broader instrument inside you, which is the emotions, the emotional register of the soul and uh, the thing that you recognize with your spirit. Things that are subtle aspects, you know, that occur because of the imminent implications of that which we see in the way that the work itself is executed, in the way that itself, in the way that it is made. So I'm speaking here about form, you know, and not content, because you, we always have this thing about form and content. To me, form is, is interesting, because form tells us about the emotional, form tells us about the artist, form tells us about the artist, and content tells us about that which he, the conceptual thing, that which he wants to say or express. But to me, the story is never interesting. Also in theater, or in movies, or in drama, I'm never interested in the story itself. I'm only interested in how do the actors and the director uh, stay within the situation. <clears throat> in theater, it is the situation which is interesting, not the story. The situation, which means the moment, you know, what is happening in the moment in the actors, in the characters, what is happening in true life, on screen, if it's a movie, or on stage, if it's theater. It's the situation in itself, it's the, it's the breath uh, of the place, the way that it etches itself like uh, a stick of charcoal onto a paper, onto a rough piece of paper. I mean, how the truth, you could say, the artistic truth, or the ex expressed phenomenons, <laughs> how they draw themselves into reality. Subtly, uh, you know. Uh, so I'm talking here of the ability to see. If the ability to see is in the artist, then he will make interesting art. If the ability to see is not in the artist, then it will be kitsch and opportunistic art, you know, art that is made for fame or for money or for provocation. And this is also really about courage, you know, because people praise courage. They say, oh, but you have to be brave to be an artist. You should must be brave. If you want success, you must be brave. And they think that it's you're very brave if you splash 10,000 pussies and a bomb and... Uh, some dying corpses and some splashy, splashy, splushy on the canvas or in the installation. Then they think that you're brave because it, oh, it's shocking. It's very strong. My God, how can it do like this? It's, it's taboo. He's opening up taboos. Wow, how brave he is. To me, that's just playing with kitschy elements. I mean, true bravery, true courage in art is something that is shown in the way that you're able to listen. If you can follow that which your instincts tells you when you are truly listening clairvoyantly to your own work, then you're brave, because then you're going your own way, then you're creating something genuine, something authentic, something that comes from you. If you have the courage to follow that which you perceive in your finer inner instrument of emotions in the spirit and in the soul and blah blah all these clairvoyant <laughs> aspects of us inside of us if we are able to follow that then that is courage you know that is courage and that is bravery uh, and also simply because it's difficult to execute it's difficult to find a form for it and and you will find it in the brush strokes or and in the absence of brush strokes you will find it in form you will not find it in content you will find it in the way that the art is made. 
So poets absolutely need this ability. They need, they poets truly need the ability to see, to be clairvoyant in empty space, so to speak, to, to be able to be very sensitive when it comes to what something can convey within a text or in an in installation. Installations are also very much a, a work of poetry in a way. Polit political poetry, <laughs> Ex existential philosophy and political poetry is, is, is an installation as long as also, of course, beauty and aesthetics. But, yeah, um, the ability to listen truly perceptively with your whole being, that's very important in an artist. And I think that's the quality of poets in a way. And there must be a huge, big part of your psyche that is as a poet. Whether you're a painter or a sculptor or, or anything, you have to have that finer, quiet, clairvoyant, sensitive space inside you where you perceive and conceive subtler aspects than what is normal to perceive. I mean, you see things that other people don't see but it will come to life in the work itself in some subtle way and the professional or the connoisseur or those who understands they will see it and appreciate it and they will see that ah oh, this has high quality this work has high quality is very well uh, thought out it's very well done you know it's uh, it bears the mark of a distinguished <laughs> spirit <laughs> with, with a high level of discernment. And you cannot have a high level of discernment if you're not clairvoyant, in a way, when it comes to these things. So, yeah, the ability to listen clairvoyantly inside the artist, in silence, is very important. To develop and to maintain. Although, of course, too, one sometimes it's very good to be expressionist and just let the stuff come out, you know, just pour the damn thing on the canvas, you know, just get it over with and <laughs> let it speak its own language, you know. Yeah, that's a way to way to go too. And if you do it in the right way with a very sensitive. I mean, people think about Jackson Pollock only as a an expressionist, you know. But he had a high, very high sensitivity. He was clairvoyant when it came to his own paintings. He truly had a sense of rhythm, of beauty, of composition, of of the relationship between positive space and negative space on the canvas and. I mean, he had a very high sensitivity for being able to perceive with his own inner being, you know. It's not just expressionist fun, it's not expressionist experimentation, it's truly listened to. I mean, perhaps not in the moment of expression, but during and in between there are a lot of pauses where he was extremely sensitive and he could see any accident very quickly and every anything that was wrong that did that is like a musical piece you know that this note is out of balance it's out of tune this this thing is not correct all right so either you fix it or you move on or, or if it can be fixed that's great if it cannot okay then we need a new canvas but i mean he he was extremely sensitive to these things, and you are sensitive to that because of clairvoyance in the inner being. You know, the that's how great art is made by being that kind of sensitive, having that kind of sensitivity inside the inner heart, soul, essence of the spirit of the person that creates and listens to art and listens to that which produces art, listens to that which becomes 
manifesta manifestations in that which we call art. Religious art is sometimes truly purely divine and sometimes of course it's it's kitsch you never know but i mean the old italian masters you know it's when you see those in original because if you want to judge an artwork you have to see the original uh, photos reproductions of paintings are usually better than the original itself if it is a bad uh, artwork or if it is low quality artwork but good art is always better in original when you see the originals of the Leonardo da Vinci's and of Giotto and thing like that then you all say oh Jesus you know it's simply divine you know it's made by God so to speak you know it, it's really truly humbling you know it's a, it's an amazing clairvoyant talent at play there it's amazing clairvoyant talent. The ability to listen is highly developed. So it's very sensitive, very delicate, very finely tuned, everything. So, yeah, and you can see that good art is always best in the original. Uh, lower quality art is always or usually better in reproduction because you can heighten everything in Photoshop you can add a little bit of strength here and there and a little bit of color here and there and a little bit of brightness here and there and a little bit of contrast here and there and you know and it suddenly it makes a bad artwork look great you know but it is a representation please remember that a photo of an artwork is a representation it's not the original if it's a if it's great work if it's good work of art made by a great artist the work in the original form is always better that's my experience and if it's if the work is of lower quality of a lesser quality artist the work is always better in reproduction because then you can strengthen it you can strengthen it with some minor manipulations of color and and uh, things like that so in the original we can truly see the intention of the artist. In the reproduction we can see that which the original <laughs> has become uh, in the marketplace, so to speak. Because reproductions are after all developed for the market. They are made for someone to like them. But the original is not made for someone to like it. Uh, the original is not made to be liked, it's, it's made for the expression in itself. But the reproduction is made for, uh, with the purpose that people should like it and attach to it and respect it and like it and want to have it and own it or whatever. But the original is free from that, uh, you could say, corruption of the intent, of the artistic intent. Uh, intent the original is free and pure there's a purity there there's a, there's a clairvoyance of the spirit which is present in the purity of the original which very seldom comes to light in a reproduction so if you're looking at a master and you're seeing a representation you will say, oh my God, this is amazing, this is divine, this is wonderful, which it is. But if it is of a master, it's usually even better in original. You should know that. And if you're surprised by a wonderful original by an artist that you thought, well, well you're not quite sure, then <laughs> it's a big chance that the reproduction is better than the original. Great art is always better in original because the purity of the intent and of the clairvoyant aspect of the artist is present in the original work. Or at least that's how it should be. All right. Thank you.